Hello and welcome to the AIM webinar series. My name is Mike Allen and I serve AIM Inc. as their Member Engagement Manager. AIM is the trusted worldwide industry association for the automatic identification industry. For nearly half a century, AIM has provided unbiased information, educational resources, and standards to providers and users of these technologies. AIM membership provides access to an insider's perspective on trends and opportunities, along with a voice in shaping the growth and future of the industry. AIM member benefits include education, advocacy, and community, as well as a role in creating industry standards through collaboration. AIM is an investment in your future. Before the presentation starts, I would like to direct your attention to your monitor to review a few housekeeping items. First, you will notice that you are muted throughout the presentation. Please do not use the raise hand option during this webinar presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please click the chat icon on the top right of your screen. After this, you'll see a chat dialog box at the bottom right of your screen. Make sure in the Send To box you select AIM Inc. Host, and then in the box below type your question. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. Today's presenter is Claude Petley, the Chief Technical Officer of the French RFID National Center. AIM would like to thank the French RFID National Center for their support of today's event. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Claude. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to thank first uh, Mike and Hayem for giving me the opportunity to talk about the price impact assessment in Europe and uh, all the changes we will have in uh, European regulation regarding the protection of uh, personal data. So, please. Uh, here is the agenda of, uh, of my presentation. I will start with a short introduction uh, of, uh, of the subject about privacy, what is an RFID operator, uh, which is very important to understand what we, what we would like to have here in Europe in, in, uh, in terms of protection of uh, personal data. Uh, after that, I will uh, have a, a, a few slides about the legal environment. Uh, First of all, the recommendations that have been issued in 2009 uh, devoted to data protection and privacy protection for RFID applications, especially. And I will uh, talk, you, talk about the future European regulation that is broader than the recommendation itself and uh, have a special article devoted to the data protection impact assessment. Uh, after that, I will... Uh, to detail on the privacy impact assessment process itself, I will explain you what are the different PI levels and what are the different steps of the process, and especially the risk analysis, which has been described in the European Standard 16571. And I will conclude my presentation with the role of the registration authority that has been set up by the European Commission in order to help the end users in the implementation of the PI process. So, in introduction, uh, what you have to bear in mind is that uh, privacy, everybody has his own uh, definition of privacy, and in fact, to, to be compliant with the different uh, European laws, you have to take this definition of privacy, which is a claim of individual to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. So it's very important when you have the definition to, 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 to note that there is focus on personal data, and it's not only data protection and data security, but it's more devoted to the privacy itself, and you have the consent of, uh, the, the notion of the personal consent. You can process any kind of personal data if you have the consent of the person, of the individual. After that, you have to take into account different uh, data and privacy classification. Of course, we talk about the physical information, the personal behaviors, the personal communication, and personal information. But don't forget about uh, the spatial privacy which are information related to the locations, the travels, where you are, and what, uh, in, what, what are you doing uh, in the, the environment. So, <coughs> regarding RFID, you can see that 
for some uh, the technologies or application citizen or individuals are aware they are using RFID. Even if they don't call it RFID, uh, but they are calling that uh, contactly, contactless uh, cards or uh, NFC. Um, so in, in, in what in that way, you can say that people are aware uh, we are processing personal data uh, with a refining. But uh, in other cases, you will have some application where people are surrounded by a RFID tag, but they are not aware that tags are out there, uh, where they are going to the store and they are buying some textile products, they are uh, loaning library books, uh, etc. Uh, so this has to be taken into account because they are, they, if they are not, con um, they are not aware that there is RFID tag, you are in fact out of flow. You can make the difference between, of course, data that can identify people directly, name, the address, or uh, any other strictly census personal data. Uh, but in your privacy impact assessment process, you have to take into account other kind of data like the unique identifiers uh, you can have in RFID tags like the TID or EPC code. Even if you think right now that this kind of data is not personal, uh, uh, you, you have to take it into account in your, in your PI process just to prove that uh, uh, the risk is limited and that the balance between the residual risk of your application on privacy and the benefit of your application is, is, is good and uh, you have the right to process such data. So, makes the distinction between security and privacy. Um, when you are an organization that uh, implements RFID application, of course, you are going to, to, to use RFID readers, RFID tags, uh, some uh, RFID application software side of, uh, of the system. Uh, you can secure all these, uh, all these devices um, and you can protect the data in the database uh, or in the RFID application. But here we are going to focus on what we call the uncontrolled domain. Uh, the uncontrolled domain is the domain where the operator of the organization which is responsible in the implementation of uh, the RFID application have no control. Uh, I can take the example of uh, a retail store. Um, when you are at the point of sale and you go out with an item that is, uh, uh, which has an RFID tag on it, uh, you can go home, you can go everywhere and the retailer has no way to protect the, the information that is still uh, active in the tag. So the uncontrolled domain is in fact the, the, the place where most of the privacy breaches uh, can occur. So you have to focus on this uncontrolled domain and not only limit your uh, privacy impact assessment on the control domain, which could be only a, a security uh, assessment. So I talk about RFID operator. Uh, an RFID operator has been uh, defined in the recommendation issued by the European Commission in 2009. Uh, just the, the, the only thing you have to, to, to remind is that any organization that read or encode the tag is considered as an RFID operator. So in order to comply with the recommendation, this operator has to prove that the tag do not go in the uncontrolled domain or otherwise he will have to implement the privacy impact assessment process. So this is mainly RFID operator are mainly what we call end users of RFID application. So let's go to the legal environment in the European Union. First of all, I, I would like for those who are not uh, um, who do not know how European legislation uh, goes, you have different levels 
<coughs> of law in Europe. The first level is what we call a recommendation. This is a soft law, in fact. This is issued by the European Commission. And as you may understand, a recommendation is just a recommendation. Uh, you should do that. It could be good if you do that, etc. But if you do not comply with the recommendations, there is no legal consequence. The second step is a directive. It is issued by the European Commission, the European Council, and the European Parliament. So it's only a, a goal that is given to the member states. Uh, a directive is not a, a, a law, strict or census. It has to be translated into national law by each member state. So this is sometimes quite difficult because if you read a directive and if you want to comply with it, you, you, you should uh, think that uh, um, you are compliant with uh, the European rules. In fact, not. You have to go to every single member state in which you want to make business, look at the national law and comply with this law. So, for example, with the directive on data protection, uh, you have to comply with the French law, you have to comply with the German one, etc. So, sometimes it's quite difficult. Uh, the, last, the last step, the last uh, kind of uh, flow is the regulation. Uh, the regulation is also issued by the three commissions, the European one, the European Council and the European Parliament. The uh, difference with the directive is that it is not um, translated into national law. This is really a European law. So if you comply with the regulation, you comply in every single member state. There is, uh, this is very important because we are going to talk about the new regulation on data protection that will supersede the uh, older directive and for um, external organizations that want to make business within Europe, it will be much more simple to comply with only one law rather than uh, with uh, different national ones. So, this said, uh, the text we have here uh, in Europe up to now regarding the, the privacy or data protection is the directive that has been issued in 1995, which is Directive 46, on the protection of individuals with regard to the processing of personal data. Uh, this directive has been translated uh, by each single member state, uh, and you have different laws, um, but this will be superseded by uh, a new regulation, so I don't go too much further uh, with this directive. We have in Europe a chart for, of fundamental rights of the European Union that has been issued in 2000, and especially Article 8. Uh, a chart is, is not a law, uh, it's just a, a, a text that, uh, uh, for, for, with which all the law will be based on. So, every time you will have a European law, it will have to comply with the chart of the fundamental rights, and especially Article 8. Uh, with the right to the protection of personal data. Uh, in this article, you, you have uh, one rule, which is that the data must be processed fairly for a specified purpose and with the consent of the person. So, this, this is very important, as I said earlier. Every single law which, deal, uh, which deals with uh, protection, data protection will have to will be based on this on this chart, on this Article 8. So, if you have not the consent of the person, be sure you will be out of law. So, the recommendation uh, that has been issued in 2009 uh, for RFID application, um, some people think that it is only devoted to retail sector. Uh, yes, there is a special article for, for this uh, special sector, but in, in fact, all the RFID technology are concerned by this recommendation. It, 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 it includes uh, the NFC uh, application or the contactless smart card for payments, for transportation, whatever the application, all the RFID, LF, HF, UHF, active, passive, are uh, in the scope of uh, this recommendation. 
For the retail sector, um, the recommendation said if the tag goes into the uncontrolled domain, you have to deactivate it. So, of course, it's very, very important for all the retailers. And it's just not only the activation of the tag, you can deactivate with a kill, of course, if you use UHF uh, technology, but you can use reduce regrange, for example, if uh, reduce regrange is reduced enough uh, and to, to a few centimeters, you can have uh, hardware deactivation with the tag destruction at the point of sale, uh, or you can have something that will destroy the tag after two or three washing machine cycles. So if you are deactivate the tag at the point of sales, there is no problem. You are compliant with the recommendation. If not, if you decided not to uh, remove the tag or kill the tag, you have to undertake a privacy impact assessment just to prove that the risk on privacy is limited. So it is up to the RFID operator to, to, to make this uh, privacy impact assessment. Uh, of course, this RFID operator can be helped by the RFID vendors or integrators in order to know exactly how they can assess the risk. So this is a recommendation. It says you have to make a privacy impact assessment every time the tag leaves the control domain. Okay, but how can I make a privacy impact assessment? What are the steps? Uh, I have to follow to, to, to be sure the privacy impact assessment is, is, is good or not, the result of this PIA is good or not. So, in the same time, the European Commission issued the recommendation. They issued a mandate uh, to the European uh, Standardization Organization in order to know is there, out there, an already existing standard or guideline which explain how to make a privacy impact assessment. This was the first phase of this mandate. And of course, we do not uh, uh, find, uh, we didn't find any very interesting documents about how to make a privacy impact assessment. So we decided to go to the phase two and uh, decided to, 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 to publish uh, different texts in two major standards. In fact, the first one, EN 16570, on the signage and public awareness, just to help the people to uh, put some emblems or uh, logos on the RFID tags uh, uh, to, to be sure that people are aware uh, we are using RFID. So this is for the consent of the individuals. And the other one, EN 16571, is on the PI process itself for the RFID application. So I will uh, detail, uh, go more in, in detail uh, on this EN uh, further in the presentation. At the same time, the French RFID National Center, the NRFID, became the registration authority for this, uh, for this standard. And I will explain what is the role of, uh, of an array for such a standard. So now we have a, a new European regulation that has been adopted uh, last May. And of course, in order to let time to different uh, uh, stakeholders to be compliant with the regulation, uh, this regulation will be binding uh, in uh, two years from now, in May uh, 2018. So this directive on data protection will supersede the or, or existing directive that has been issued in 1995, of course. As I said, this is a regulation, so there will be no transposition into national law. So everybody that uh, comply with the regulation uh, and will have a, a label or a certification in Germany, for example, can go directly to France or to Poland or to any other uh, EU member states and, and claim that they are already compliant with the regulation. So it will 
be much more easier for uh, for the stakeholders to to prove the compliance with the regulation. This is in fact to to help what we call here the digital single market uh, in Europe. So in this regulation, there are a lot of things in order to protect uh, personal data, and especially uh, Article 33 uh, that says that the controller, what we call for the RFID, the the RFID operator, in fact, shall carry out an assessment of the impact of the envisaged uh, processing operation. So, in fact, this is what they call a data protection impact assessment, which is much broader than only privacy impact assessments, but it includes privacy aspects. And the Article 33 describes the minimal requirements. Um, of course, a systematic description of the processing uh, of uh, personal data. Uh, an assessment of the necessity and proportionality of the processing. Uh, do you have to process such data for your application? Uh, yes, of course, you have to prove it. Uh, an assessment of the risk uh, on the privacy and on the security of the data. You will have to describe the measure you have uh, uh, implemented to mi mitigate the risk. Uh, a list of the safeguard and safety measures and you have to indicate how many times you will uh, keep this uh, data in your database or in your application. And of course, once you do not, um, when you do not need any more this data, you have to erase them. So, this is quite simple, but once again, in this regulation, there is no indication how to make the data, pri data protection impact assessment. So, you can go to what we have done for the RFID with the EN16571 with different process, different steps uh, to be sure you, you, you forget nothing about the different risk and you assess the risk uh, correctly. <clears throat> so, the price impact assessment which is described in, this, in, in the EN16571 of course, you have first to identify the, the assets. Uh, the assets is, is related to, to the data you are going to process. And in the data, you can have data that can identify individual directly or indirectly. And you have to take into account both of uh, this kind of data. Of course, these data are different depending on what kind of information you, you will process. Uh, we have different uh, classification, different categories. Uh, the two first one we call PI, personal identifier, like uh, the name, the email or DNA information, or PB, personal behavior, your age, your religion, political affiliation, sexual orientation, or things like that are very important and you will have to, to, um, to take care of this, of this kind of data. But you have to, to, to take into account all the other kind of data like a TH, tag and hardware, uh, for example the RFID chip ID, the TID or UID, uh, a residual value you could have in a loyalty card or travel card, uh, every information about time and location um, or identity of things like uh, EPC code, for example. So, do not forget to um, assess the risk on this uh, other information which are not directly related to, to, to the individuals but can be linked to individuals. So another thing you have to take into account in your PRA is where the data is stored or processed. Um, we have a, what we call a privacy in depth model. Uh, in this model, we have all the layers for an RFID application from uh, the upper part in red, which is related to the RFID technology itself with the RFID memory, with the RF uh, interface, 
with their RFID interrogators, and the lower part, which is more related to the software part of, uh, of the application with the host computer, the application, and related database. So depending on where the data is stored or processed, of course, the risk and mitigation measure uh, will be different. So I told you about the PI level. Um, in fact, to, to assess the level of uh, the PI you will have to undertake, you will only have to answer three basic questions. Uh, the first one is, does the RFID tag store any data that are classified as personal identifier or personal behavior? So if you have, for example, the name of an individual in an RFID tag, you will answer yes to this question. So in that case, you are in the what we call the level 3 PIA, the highest level of the PIA. If no, you will have to answer the second question. Does the application, the, the software part of the RFID application, store or process any data that are classified as personal identifier or behavior? For example, you can have um, an RFID tag with nothing else than a, than a, a unique chip ID, uh, but uh, in your application, this unique chip ID is linked to a name or address of an individual in a database. In that case, you will answer yes to this question and you will go to the level two of the PI process. If no, if you do not process uh, neither in the RFID tag nor in the application uh, software part of the application, uh, you will have to answer the third question, is the RFID tag carried or associated with an individual? Um, for example, it could be a, a, a retail tag that has nothing else than a unique chip ID and there is no link with the individual at the point of sale. So you go out of the store with the, with the tag on, on your item. Uh, so you will answer yes to this question, yes, because the tag is uh, linked to, 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 to an individual with no PI or PB uh, information. Uh, you will have so a level one PIA. And of course, if you answer no to this third question, it means that your application has nothing to do with uh, uh, personal information. So you are at the level zero, so you have no PIA to do. So the level, different levels, zero, no PIA, level one, you will focus only on the RFID air interface uh, threats. On level two, you will focus on uh, threats on your uh, software layer for PI and PBs, uh, and you will, uh, of course, consider all the other threats for all, all of the data types you have in your application. And for level three, you will consider all kind of threats for uh, every kind of data. Whatever the level, uh, don't forget you have to consider, of course, the control domain and for sure the uncontrolled domain where, where much of uh, the privacy breaches can occur. So the PI flowchart is very simple. In fact, every time you have a new application you, will have, you want to implement, or if you have an existing RFID application but you change um, something in the process, you can change the tags, you can change the readers, uh, you can change the way you process data in your database, you will start the PI process. Uh, to help you in this, uh, in this work, you have some uh, documents that have been published by uh, European Commission. Uh, you could have, for example, templates from uh, different sectors. Uh, if, uh, for example, GS1 decided to, uh, to, to, to implement a template for the retail sector, it could help all the retailers to, uh, to, to make the PIA easier and faster. And you have one kind of document we call capability statements. Uh, capability statements come from the vendors who declare uh, all the features you can use to protect the privacy. 
So the step zero is the RFID functional statement with the first question, is the RFID tag carried or associated with an individual? If you say no, of course, there is no PI required, but you have a document that you can send to the data protection authority just to say, I do not make a PI, but I have the right not to, 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 to implement a PI. If you answer yes, you go to the uh, step one, which is the detailed description of your application and the data, uh, personal data process. After that, you go in what we call the privacy risk assessment loop, in fact. You will identify the assets and you will give a value of, for the assets between zero and four. I will explain why it is, it is zero to four uh, for the value of uh, the asset. You will determine the PI level, which could be one, two or three. And you will then identify the threats and the likelihood of the threats which can be low, medium, or high. Uh, you will assess uh, the vulnerability of, uh, of the data, which could be also low, medium, or high. And you will have very easily a first risk value. After that, you can choose or not to implement some countermeasures to mitigate the risk. Uh, of course, it will lower the risk uh, if you choose to implement uh, some uh, interesting countermeasures. And you will have what we call a residual risk, the risk that you cannot uh, lower. Uh, and this risk has to be accepted uh, by the, the RFID operator. And the balance between this residual risk and the benefit of the application has to be proved or shown to the Data Protection Authority. So you will accept this residual risk, you will complete the PI report and send it to the DPA, Data Protection Authority. <clears throat> so let's go much more in detail on the risk analysis part of the PI. So as I said, you have to identify and, and, and give a value of the assets. Uh, assets can identify people directly or indirectly. So take into account even EPC codes, loyalty card numbers, TID, whatever, uh, the value of this data will be lower than the value of uh, the name or an email, for example, for sure, but take that into account into your privacy impact assessment. So as I said, the value is between zero and four. Uh, in fact, we decided to use ISO 27005 to, uh, to evaluate the, the, the risk. This is because this is a, a um, well-established ISO standards, and everybody agrees that using this, uh, this standard, you will have a good value of the risk. So I give you an example of uh, a membership, uh, membership card. In this application, you will have information that are processed or stored in the software part of the application, like, uh, for example, a unique membership code, uh, with a value of three, um, you will have the name, uh, the address, you will have a digital photo, etc. And you have information that are encoded in the tag itself. So not all the values of the data are uh, encoded in the tag. You have only valid dates, you have a photo ID reference, you have a unique membership code, and you have some things that is not processed in the software part, which is the chip ID. So the values that are given here are in fact given in the, in the EN16571. So if you want to follow this, uh, this standard, you don't have to, uh, to think too, too much to the value. Take the value that is given in the standard. If you do not agree with this value, if you said, hmm, digital photos value is four, it's too much, uh, I will uh, put the value of two or three, uh, you will have to explain to the Data Protection Authority why you consider that the value given in the standard is not uh, the right one. So after that, you will have to identify the threats and uh, you have to give a value of the threats, which could be low, medium or high. Uh, don't take too much time in describing different uh, scenarios of attack. Just consider that RFID could be 
um, have two main threats. Device dropping, when you are listening um, a communication between a real tag and a real reader, and you want to access some data uh, by listening to this, uh, this communication. Uh, or you have tag activation. If you have tag activation, you take what we call a, a fake reader that will try to access information in a real tag. Of course, um, every kind of scenario will be a mix of event dropping and tag activation. Uh, if you take, uh, for example, the relay attack, you will uh, try to make communication between a real tag and a real reader, but that that are too far away to communicate, but with the fake tag and a fake reader, you, you try to make them communicate. So, um, in fact, you just have to consider if it's dropping and tag activation and give a value of uh, of the um, of the threats regarding your application. So, after that, you have to access the vulnerabilities. Vulnerability, as I said, could be low, medium, or high. It's also very simple. Low is uh, it means that the threat, of course, uh, is just theoretical. You cannot implement it in the real world. Um, medium, yes, it is possible to implement the threat, but uh, it requires some skills, some materials you cannot uh, uh, have in, in, in the everyday life. And high is when the threat has been already exploited in the real world. For the vulnerability, you have to take into account the exposure time. Uh, we said in the EM that uh, if people are wearing tags less than 50 consecutive days, we can consider that the vulnerability is one is, is um, one value lower. So if you consider, for example, a vulnerability that is high, but the exposure time is less than 50, 50 days, uh, it goes to medium. So the risk matrix value is the, the, the one you can find in the EN16571 or in ISO 27005. You have the value of the asset, which is between 0 and 4. You have the likelihood of the threat, uh, if a dropping of tag activation, which could be low, medium, or high. The vulnerability also low, medium, or high. So the value of the risk is between 0, there is absolutely no risk, and 8 which is the highest value of the risk. So if we take an, an example of a library book just for <coughs> the asset, which is the unique identifier, which is, uh, which is uh, on the tag, the value is 2. If we consider the threat that is tag activation, we consider it as medium. But the vulnerability is high because we use, for example, of course, a UHF protocol with no encryption. So it's very easy to, to read the tag and to have the unique identifier. So if I follow the uh, matrix, I have an initial risk value of 5 over 8, uh, which could be considered very high just for a, a unique identifier in the book. But, uh, as I said, if we consider that the exposure is less than 50 consecutive days, we can lower the risk by 1, so the initial risk value is, uh, in fact, 4 over 8. Of course, this is before implementing any countermeasure. And the countermeasure we, we can uh, implement uh, in, in the EN are classified as embedded in the tag, for example, if you have a, a crypto suite uh, that you can use in attack to protect the data, uh, this is a, a, a countermeasure. Other countermeasures are available in the technology but require an action by the RFID operator, for example, the kill function. Um, of course, every single UHF tag has a kill function, but if the retailer decided not to implement it, it's not countermeasure, in fact. Uh, after that, you have uh, countermeasures that are independent of the hardware, uh, like removal uh, of the tag, 
whatever the technology, if you can remove the tag before it goes in the uncontrolled domain, this is a countermeasure. And the last one could be very interesting is the advice to the individual. If you advise the individual that you are uh, using RFID and that RFID tags are uh, uh, linked to, to different items, uh, it's a countermeasure. So the rule in the EN is very basic. Every time you implement a countermeasure, what, whatever it is, you lower the risk by one. So if I take the example of my library book with the initial risk value of four, uh, if I just put uh, an RFID emblem on the tag or on the book, uh, it's an advice to, to, to the individual. So my risk goes down to three. In a, if I implement another countermeasure, whatever it is, uh, I will go down to a risk of two, etc., etc. Of course, if you implement a countermeasure that prevents the tag to go in the uncontrolled domain, like for example a kill function or a removal of the tag at the point of sale or at the, at the, at the library, the risk goes directly to zero. It's not only minus one, it's zero, because the tag is no more active uh, in the uncontrolled domain, so there is, in fact, no PIA to make. Um, together with, uh, with the UK-based uh, software uh, company, we decided to, 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 to make a software to help the RFID operator in such uh, a process. So they have to just explain what kind of uh, process they are uh, using, well, describe their application, what kind of uh, tags and readers they are using, and with that they just click on the countermeasures that are available and they have uh, the, the, the final risk value. So it's very easy. We are sure that they the RFID operator will not forget to declare uh, a unique chip ID or a EPC code or things like that. So, so it's very easy to, to, to use. And the, the risk reduction uh, equation we use it is more sophisticated than just reducing the risk by one because uh, you are, uh, I think you agree when I say that uh, uh, implementing a countermeasure with the uh, crypto suites has not the same um, impact that just uh, advising people that RFID tags are out there. Okay, so you will have the risk your risk. This is a risk that you cannot cancel. Uh, you will have to accept it and to prove to the data protection authorities that the risk is. Uh, uh, is lower regarding the benefit of the application. So there is some explanation to give to the DPA. Uh, but okay, that's the residual risk. The residual risk can be zero if you implement the kill function, for example, of course. So, as like I said, the registration authority, uh, just to conclude my, my presentation, um, in the end, we, de we decided to, to set up such, uh, such an array just to help the end users, the retailers, uh, um, in fact, the RFID operators to implement the, the privacy impact assessment. What kind of uh, countermeasures they can implement? Not sure that the retailer knows that, uh, for example, in their tag they have a mute command or they can hide the TID or things like that. And when they are going to search so, such information in the data sheet, it could be a nightmare. So we decided to, 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 to help them in a very si simple uh, document that, are, that is completed by the RFID vendors. Uh, of course, we as a French uh, organization, uh, we verify that what is declared by the vendors is correct. And uh, for example, if they declare that you can mute the tag, uh, but if it's not possible, we will not have these features in the, uh, in the document. So this document can be downloaded on the website. And here is an example of, uh, uh, I give you an example of our name pinch product 
but uh, you can find information for EM, NXP, ST microelectronic products. Um, this is very simple for the vendor to, to tick the box. They are complying with uh, with different uh, uh, different standards. They are uh, supporting some commands, and they can, as you can see at the bottom part uh, at the right, uh, declare some uh, additional proprietary features. So for for this uh, special one, uh, Monza for QT, they uh, in pinch declare you can hide the TID serialization, you can you can hide the EPC, and of course these features can help in protecting the privacy because uh, the, the 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 TID or the EPC is no more unique and it cannot be uh, related or linked to an individual, of course. So here's the website of the registration authority. You can search for product, you can register your product if you are an RFID vendor. And if you do not find the product you are using uh, for, for, your, for your application, you can ask the, the area to, to request officially uh, information to, to the vendor. So in conclusion, I think mm, now all the RFID operators have all the, mm, the tools uh, to undertake a, pay, a PI very, very easy. Um, uh, so if we consider that uh, uh, the regulation that will be, uh, will be active in uh, May eight, 2018, uh, I think now everybody can comply with this uh, regulation right now. You do not have to, to wait uh, in, in two years from now to, to, to make your PIA. So, of course, we focus on RFID, uh, and as I said, it, it could be NFC, it could be LF, HF, whatever the technology. Uh, but this process can be used for any other kind of uh, of technologies that process uh, that process personal data, especially wireless one, like uh, uh, Bluetooth low energy, Wi-Fi, whatever. So just a, a, a word about the, the emblem. Uh, if you want to apply this countermeasure uh, officially, you will have to use this emblem, which is based on the uh, ISO standard for which AM is the registration authority. So you can put this kind of emblem on your uh, on your product and on your store on your website. Sorry, um, you could have more information like a short description of your application, who is the uh, RFID operator, and where the individual can have um, more information with uh, an email address, a website, or a phone number, for example. So thank thank you very much for your attention. Um, of course, if you have any questions, I would be more than pleased to, to answer. All right. Thank you, Claude, for that great presentation. And it does look like we received a few questions for our AIM webinar Q&A session. Now, if uh, you're still in the room and have an additional question to ask, remember to use the uh, chat icon at the top right of your screen. Just click that, type that in your question, and I will receive that and uh, ask Claude it. Uh, but let me move forward with the questions we do have here. Uh, first, when does the operator have to send the PIA report to the Data Protection Authority? Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Mike, your question was? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask it again. Uh, when does the operator have to send the PIA report to the Data Protection Authority? Uh, yeah. Um, if if we follow the, the recommendation, um, in fact, uh, before the implementation of the RFID application, uh, you will have to make a PI. You cannot make a PI after uh, the, the, the real implementation. And you have, in fact, six weeks uh, before the implementation to send uh, the, the, the report. Uh, this means that the Data Protection Authority is aware that you are going to to process data uh, and perhaps personal data with RFID technologies. Uh, up, up to now, uh, you, you will 
not wait to have a, a, a green light uh, to implement it. If you follow the rule of the six weeks, uh, six weeks after, you, you can implement your, uh, your application. Okay. Another question we received, is there any labeling process that could certify that the PIA process and result are compliant with the regulation? Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, there is different steps. Uh, the first one is to have uh, a regulation. So we have it right now. Uh, the second step is to have um, a standard document that explains how to make a PIA and describes the PIA uh, process itself. Uh, after that, we will have, uh, and it is uh, already um, prepared in the regulation, we will have some labelization or certification process. For that, we need the um, organizations that will uh, promote the, the label, and of course they will have some uh, documents that explain who, how um, the PIA has to be done uh, and the steps to follow to be compliant with, uh, with the label or with the certification uh, document. Up to now, there is no such organization that uh, started this kind of uh, certification process, but uh, be sure that before the 2018, you, you will have some in Europe. Um, so, but just to be honest, um, French RFID National Center uh, think about that. And say, yes, we, we, we have a standard, so we, we are near to have a, a certification process. Uh, but we want to be sure that the Data Protection Authority will um, take into consideration such a, such a, such a certification. Um, it's quite complex, but uh, I, I'm quite sure that uh, organization will do that be, be before, within one or two years from now. AEM, as, a, uh, as an organization, could, could start this kind of process to help uh, the members uh, in the implementation of PIA in order to be sure that uh, the results of the PIA will be accepted by uh, the data protection authorities. Yeah, it's definitely a good idea. We'll definitely have to look into that. And I see that we have another question regarding the PIA, uh, and they are asking, is it possible to undertake a PIA before the application is implemented in order to prove that the application is privacy by design compliant? Oh, yeah. Uh, in the regulation, yes, I, I forget to mention that, but uh, there is so many articles in the regulation. Uh, but there, there is a special one that is devoted to what we call in Europe privacy by design and privacy by default. Uh, every single application that process data, whatever the technology, will have to prove that uh, all the counter, possible countermeasures have been implemented to protect the privacy. And from the start of the um, definition of the application. So it's not we are going to implement an application and after one we will think about the privacy and add countermeasures. Countermeasures are to be taken into account from the beginning of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the process. Uh, of course, to show and to prove that privacy by design uh, uh, has been taken into account in, in the creation of the application, making the PIA before it is uh, really implemented could help in proving that the risk uh, value is the lower, lowest one we can achieve with the existing technologies, with the state-of-the-art uh, technologies. And, of course, you can prove uh, also that uh, your application is privacy by default. It means that it is a lower risk 
uh, at the beginning, but after individual can change the setup, can decide it to share information, but of course they are uh, conscious that they are uh, given they are given some information about them. So you have the consent of the person of the of the individual, so you are compliant with the regulation. That's a key point. Every time you have the consent of the individual, you can do whatever you want. Okay, great. Um, another question we received, uh, they were asking, is the regulation retroactive? Is the regulation, sorry? Is the regulation retroactive? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a rule in, in Europe or in every single member state. Every time you you publish a law, uh, uh, you have a, what we call a promulgation. I don't know if it's a real English uh, word. In fact, you, you have a date uh, at which you have to comply with the law and. This date cannot be before the publication of, uh, of, of the text. So, uh, if I well remember, the, the law will be, the regulation will be active uh, in uh, May 2018. I think it's the 25th of May 2018. Um, if you implement an RFID application uh, the 24th, of May, uh, you will not have to be compliant with the law. But remember, every time you will make a single change in your application, uh, for example, you are using a, a UHF tag from a, from a vendor and you decided to change, oh yes, this vendor is no, uh, I will change the vendor and the kind and the type of tag. Okay. This is a change in your application. So, if you change the tag the 26th of May, yes, you are uh, obliged to comply with the law. So, you, you can speed up the process and go uh, and implement your application right now before, before the, 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 the deadline, but one day or another, you will have to, to, to comply with it. All right, and uh, one last question before we go. Are we obliged to put the RFID emblem on every single product? And going along with that, is it possible to use other logos like those we have on contactless payments, cards, or NFC devices? Uh, no, uh, uh, you are not obliged. Uh, if we take the, the, the recommendation, in fact, the recommendation says, um, please be careful with the privacy, so make a privacy impact assessment if you are if your RFID tag goes in, in, in the in control domain. Uh, and one countermeasure is to put an RFID uh, emblem on the tag just to be sure that people are aware uh, RFID tags are out there. If you decide not to use this kind of countermeasure, okay, you will have a, a, a risk that will be higher than uh, if you decided to use this emblem. But so, so you are not obliged. And regarding the regulation, uh, the regulation says you have to um, it, you have to be sure that the people are aware you are processing data and you have to have their consent in processing such data. So if you decided to use another way to make the people aware or to have their consent, uh, not using the logo or the emblem. It's your choice. So, what I said in the presentation is just putting a, a, an emblem on the tags, on the labels, or on the item uh, is an easy way to lower the risk by one. That's, that's all. And to be really compliant with the recommendation, of course, uh, using other emblems like the NFC logos or uh, uh, contactless payment cards logo you can have on your uh, payment card it is not seen as a real um, information to the individuals because 
people don't make, do not make the, dis the difference between NFC or uh, uh, with uh, with the logo we have on the payment cards. No, you have to say it's RFID. Okay, but and that concludes our Q and A session. Now, if you didn't get a chance to have your question answered, you can always email me at mike at aimglobal dot org. Uh, ask me the question you have for Claude, and I can forward that over to him. We can try to get you an answer to that question. So thank you, Claude, for your insight and knowledge and for providing us with this presentation today. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to all the participants. And uh, if you have any question, I, as Mike said, do not hesitate to, to, to send me an email or to send an email to Mike. Great, and thank you to our audience for their active participation. I hope that you all found this information to be valuable. We would appreciate your feedback, so please take the time to complete a brief session evaluation, which will be sent out to you all shortly. This information will be used to develop the future presentations in our AIM webinar series and future AIM Inc. events. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye to everyone.